Well, is hell a real place? Former atheist professor Howard Storm shares the shocking truth about what lies beyond and the only hope he found on the other side. If you're enjoying Table Talk, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And remember to click that notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest posts. Well, is heaven real? What about hell? And how confident are you in the answers to those questions? Well, today, with the help of our special guest, we'll hear a firsthand account of one man's journey that answered those questions and transformed his life. First joining me around the table <laughs> is my daughter in love, Susanna Lamb. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you for having me. You love hearing stories about people that go to the other side and come back. It's truly life-giving. I get a little <laughs> jealous, I have to be honest. <laughs> like, I want to see what they saw, but thank you for sharing. <laughs> you know, when we did the interview earlier with our guest today, I could, you're sitting beside me and I can hear you <laughs> on certain parts, especially when it comes to Jesus. You get very emotional it's thinking true. about it, right? I think I think almost every day of my life, I think about that moment that he'll hug me because I'm physical touch. I want it so bad. <laughs> it's okay, I have to wait. <laughs> it's coming. All right, Annie Kendall, how are you? I am great and I'm excited about this show. I think we're going to learn some really interesting things that we all maybe don't know. Right. That's right. Rachel Lamb Brown. We are citizens of heaven. Yes. We are citizens of heaven. Mm -hmm. Your dad's already there. I know. You're going to make sure you get to see him again, aren't you? <laughs> I better. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Cindy Murdoch, I'm so sorry to hear about the loss of your brother. Aww. Just ask everyone watching to pray for you and pray for your Thank mother. You. He's now a citizen of heaven. He is. And, and He's there with your dad. Yes. And I know why people say heaven sounding sweeter all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And seeing that because definitely is. So how's your family and how are you? We're, we feel the prayers. So yeah. thank you. I think it's just another um, reality of those that we love that go on and they do that transition into eternity and heaven before us. Yes. So anxious to be with them. Well, uh, for, for the second time, uh, back at the table, Howard Storm, welcome. Thank you. So good to have you here today. Thank you. Good I told to my here. mother you were going to be on with your story because it had impacted me so many years ago when you were here. And uh, she said, well, I know who he is. She said, did he get saved? And I said, yes, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, then I figured out she thought I was talking about Howard Stern. Oh, no, 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 no. no. no, 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 no. I said, no, Mom. No. I said, no, Mom. This is Howard Storm. But we're praying for Howard Stern. Yes. Right? Yes. 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 Well, he, he was a devout atheist and college professor driven to challenge and convert any believer he crossed paths with, but he had little idea that he would soon be confronted with the reality of just how true eternity is. So let's go back, if we can, Howard, to the fact that you, God had gifted you with a, a, a great mind and a high IQ. You became a college professor and uh, tell us about th those early days of teaching and, and why were you so bent on discouraging Christian students? Well, one of the ways of interpret interpreting our culture is it's, about, it's all about success, mm. be becoming something. And one way to describe it is becoming an egomaniac. You know, mm. really successful people are just passionate about their success. They get their blinders on and they don't care about anybody or anything. They don't care who they step on, who they walk over to get there. And um, that's what I got. The biggest, baddest bear in the forest wins. Dog eat dog, be the baddest dog. That's what I got out of my culture. And Christianity seemed to, um, not represent any of that stuff at all. Christianity seemed to be like wimpy and, and like silly. And um, the people that I knew in the university all believed in um, the scientific method and science and materialism. And anything that wasn't observable and testable was fantasy or lunacy. Right. And you and I talked earlier that at the, at the end of the day, what is at the bottom of the woodpile, if you will, of many of those hearts are individuals that don't want to be accountable to God. Absolutely, because um, one of the things that I love about God is that I have a higher authority 
that I have to answer to with everything I do, how I speak to you and how I speak to you and how I treat you and what I think about you. Okay, so let's go back to um, that faithful day. You had taken uh, some of your art students to Paris, France to study some of the art exhibits there. You had been there for three weeks and on the last day something happened. What was yeah. it? I had a perforation of the small stomach and it knocked me to the ground in terror, screaming, kicking. Um, I didn't have any idea what was going on. My wife called the, um, the desk at the hotel. They called an emergency service. The doctor came very quickly, got me off the ground and said that you've had a perforation of the duodenum and if you don't have surgery within an hour, you'll probably die. So he called an ambulance and they took me to the big um, city hospital where I was examined in emergency by um, two very kind doctors, an x-ray and medical history and all that stuff, and said, said the same thing that the doctor at the hotel did, and then they sent me by gurney off to the surgical hospital. But unfortunately, socialized medicine, a Saturday, there was no surgeon available at the surgical hospital because they only worked five days a week. So I said, if you, a scale from one to 10, what was your pain level? 10. Oh my goodness. And it got worse. How does that even happen? Do you even know how you had that perforation? Maybe ulcers. It might be an ulcer or it might have been um, a foreign object like a little piece of glass or something had gotten lodged in my stomach. We'll never know. But what was happening was because it perforated, mm -hmm. then the acid from the stomach yeah. was literally dripping, I guess, and causing damage to... I was digesting my inside oh, with my goodness. own digestive juices. Yeah. It burns. Yeah. So without a surgeon, what happened? Um, 10 hours. No medication, no doctor's orders, no, no nothing. It's so hard for Americans to understand this, so just your, nothing. And your wife is there trying to get somebody to help you, but yeah. they, they're not able to locate a doctor to come. Yeah. So, okay, so there you are in excruciating pain and something supernatural happens. Yeah. So I, um, a nurse said they were unable to locate a doctor there to try and get the ne next day. And I said goodbye to my wife and I went unconscious. And then I awoke from the unconscious and I felt completely physically intact, better than I'd ever felt in my whole life. And I tried to communicate with my wife, got no response from her. But what? I saw you saw in your the bed. yourself. I saw myself and that was extremely upsetting. Mm -hmm. So now I'm confused. I'm um, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I, like, am I losing my mind? What's going on here? And then I heard people calling me outside the room and they were saying, Howard, Howard, come on, come with us. We're waiting for you. And I went over to the room and I said, I need a doctor. I'm supposed to have surgery. And they said, we know all about you. We've been waiting for you a long time. You've got to come with us now. So I thought that they were going to take me to a doctor, theoretically to surgery. Mm -hmm. And instead they took me on a very long journey into abject, complete darkness. And at the end of that journey, when I refused to go with them any further, with their fingernails and their teeth, they tore me apart to shreds. Mm. And did you feel all of that? Oh yeah, very much so. You felt all of that, and you said in the natural, had it been these earthly suits that we're wearing right now, yeah. it would have killed you, that would have been mortal oh, wounding. Oh, absolutely. But it was like your spirit man was being yeah. destroyed and then all of a sudden you hear a voice that says pray to God and I thought I don't believe in God and the voice said pray to God a little more insistent and I thought wow. I don't know how to pray and the voice said very insistent pray to God wow. and I thought okay when I was a kid and I said some I muttered some prayers and to my Great surprise, the people around me were screaming at me, there is no God, nobody can hear you, we're gonna do much worse things to you. But while they're screaming these threats at me, they're also backing off into the darkness, disappearing Because you were saying away. Jesus. Yeah. You, you were saying the name of Jesus. So I, I called on Jesus eventually when I drove them off and I said, Jesus, please save me. And with that, Jesus came as a tiny pinpoint of light, mm. got very, very bright very quickly. Like there's some bright lights in this room right now, but his light was much brighter. So it's a funny kind of light because if it had been this light, it would have hurt. It would have been too intense, yeah. but it was full of love.
And out of this body of light that was standing before me emerged hands and arms, and he reached down and touched me. And when he touched me, all of the gore that I was just drifted away, and I became completely intact. And his hands went underneath my body and gently picked me up and held me very, very strongly up against him. And I had my arms around him. And my intention was to never, ever let him go, wow. which in a way I've been trying to hang on to him. You're still since. holding on. Yeah. You're still yeah. holding to his hand. Yeah. You said seven years ago that you had never, ever felt anything like this. And the best way you could describe it is liquid love. Yeah. His love, his love is not, it's not an emotion. It's not a theory. It's palpable. It permeates your okay. being. Um, and I have to go to that memory of that love frequently in my life because it's, it's really what our, our being comes from. God is love, mm -hmm. and that's the, the source of our being. And um, it's really like what our soul is, and we need to, go, we need to get in touch with that once yes. in a while. Okay, so um, all of a sudden you said, as he's wrapped his arms around you, he whisked you into another time and another place right yeah. outside of heaven. You, we, thought, you thought it was right outside of heaven. We were right outside of heaven. We, we had moved very rapidly out of what that did it, world. Before we, we talk about what he said, what did it look like, like where you were at that when, moment? As we were approaching heaven, my first impression was that it was the most ginormous galaxy in the universe. Oh. And then I realized that all the components, all those little tiny bits of light were all moving in and out. And so like, okay, stars don't move that way. <laughs> you know, they go around, mm -hmm. you know, in orbits. And, um, and uh, then I, I realized that they were all beings, billions and billions, trillions of trillions of beings coming and going. So did you see heaven in front of you? Was, yeah. was, I know a lot of people have talked about that field, the grassy field that's in front of heaven. Did you see anything like that? How did you? Oh yeah, Jesus gave me a tour of heaven and it's full of everything that one could possibly ever hope for. Everything that's good is there and it's all beautiful. Did you There's see nothing people? bad about heaven. Did you see people in heaven? Oh, yeah. But I didn't get to interact because Jesus and I were um, getting a tour. At that point, you didn't know that you weren't going to get to go into heaven. But then, as a professor, you told me that you would interview uh, teachers that would come yeah. to the school. Yeah. You were one of the ones that would do the interview. So I was the head of the department, yeah. Yeah, and so you had a million questions mm -hmm. for Jesus. But one of the first things you told me that he said to you is you kind of thought, you didn't even say it, you just thought, I don't deserve to be here. And he said to you, I've loved you every day of your life. Yeah, and he said, we don't make mistakes. You do deserve to be mm -hmm. here. You belong here. Wow. Um, I was, you were, we were all made to, this world is school. It's really that simple. This world is school, the curriculum, what we're here to learn is to love God and love our neighbor and ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we, when we graduate from this school, we go to heaven to be with God forever. And in heaven, we become more and more like Christ. We grow in heaven. Okay, so while you were there, you said that you began to ask him all kinds of questions. How did he respond to those questions? And how long did it take you to ask all the questions you wanted to ask? Okay, so I went through um, 12 years of public school, four years of undergraduate school, seven years of graduate school. Best teacher I ever had, kind, patient. Um, and the thing that I loved about him is he's really into AV, audiovisual aids. So <laughs> like he would show me things, wow. he would take me places, he would try and explain. If I didn't understand something, I said, I didn't, I didn't get that. I said, okay, let me, let me explain it to you and make it more simple. Like one of the things, um, I said, so what's the whole point? What's the whole point of this life? And he said, um, and he explained it to me, and I was like, I totally didn't understand what you're saying. He said, okay, he said, here, understand this. It's a garden. We are part of God's garden, and we've been put here to bloom. Mm -hmm. Some of us don't, because we, for whatever, for a variety of reasons, choose not to, and some of us do. And God wants all of his beautiful children mm -hmm. to bloom. So, like, that's my job. That's your job. We're here to bloom and to do the, with the gifts that we've been given, also known as talents, to, to use those to our best ability. 
Okay, so after you, he answered all these questions about what, how long did it take? Like, cause again. Longer than I went to graduate school, which was three years. Wow. So it felt like three years yeah. in heaven. Yeah. Wow. It's impossible to measure time in heaven cause there is no time. Um, I want, when I go back, I have my bucket list of things to do. Like for example, my, one of my heroes besides Jesus is uh, St. Paul. And um, I want to have some time with St. Paul. We, we, we oh, you got your bucket list for heaven. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I have to ask everybody what their bucket list is. What's your bucket list for heaven, Susie? <laughs> oh, I, I want to go back and like a movie, I want to watch the history of the earth from day one to watch it like a oh, movie. That's Wouldn't neat. that be cool? That would be, oh. yes, yeah. yes. Anna, what about you? Well, I'm like you. I really look forward to spending time with Paul. He's my favorite Aww. New Testament yeah. person besides Jesus. So yeah. I really look forward to that. Rachel? I want to see all the people that I never got to meet, like meet Josh's dad and your brother and yeah, dad's sister and oh yeah, all the people, all your loved ones. I like that too. I I think I would like to go back through the history of our families and yeah. just meet yeah. a lot of our ancestors and hear their stories yeah. and and Cindy, Cindy's okay. like I just want to see my brother again. Yeah, and really. Your dad. Yeah, and you know I hadn't thought about that a whole lot because I guess I'm so. A, amazed by God himself and Jesus just wanting to actually see them. Yeah. And just be able to actually comprehend their yeah. presence. Well, okay, at some point, Jesus told you, you aren't staying. Did you argue with him? Yes, because anybody who's had any glimpse, any hint of heaven wants to be there because it's the best and this mm -hmm. is not. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> I wanted to go and be in heaven forever and ever. Yes. And he said, no. He said, he literally said, you do not have the character. You wouldn't fit in. You need to go back and develop Ooh. a character wow. to, to fit into heaven. So I've been back here trying to be the kind of person that God created me to be so that I can go to heaven. Okay, well, we have to now get you back in your body and we need to get surgery for you. Right. So, okay, you're back in your body. And and, and, you, and and you had felt and, no pain, and all of a sudden you're feeling that um, excruciating. I was back in the pain and the nurse immediately, when I came back, instantly the nurse came back to the room. It's now nine o'clock at night. This had happened or between 8.30 and 9. And she said, a doctor has arrived at the hospital and you're gonna have the surgery now. Um, which is crazy, you know, doctors show up at nine o'clock on Saturday <laughs> night when there was no doctor all day. But anyways, God thing. And uh, I needed the surgery, Yes. you know, and. So you went into surgery, was everything successful? In closing no, it was a disaster, actually. On Tuesday, God said to me, this, now this was audible. Like a lot of when I say God talked to me, usually it's like in my head. Right. Right. But this was audible in the room. Nobody was in the room, unfortunately. God said, you need to go home on Sunday. This was on Tuesday. You need to go home on Sunday because you're going to die here. Because um, I had become septic. Mm. Oh, wow. The, yes. um, yeah. Because of the lack of attention, the infection had spread through my whole body and they hadn't cleaned me out properly. So, um, so you I, flew back I, home. After well, the I was, I was going down mm. physically in the French hospital and they weren't giving me anything. They weren't doing anything. It was awful. So, um, I flew home and the doctor who admitted me, who was my family doctor said, I don't know how you made it here. You're way too sick. How'd you ever get home? Wow. Um, I was in the hospital for three months. For three months. Yeah, three okay, months. so interestingly enough, even though you were in the hospital, are you telling everyone about what happened to you and what are people thinking? Because I understand your wife was an atheist. <laughs> you were really septic. And you were yeah. surrounded by a lot of atheists and people yeah. didn't believe My you, God. My kids, yeah. doctors, and everything. Um, it was a disaster because I didn't want anybody to go to hell. Exactly. That was the number one in my mind. I don't want you to go to hell. Yeah. And I it's wanted a real people place. to it's know Jesus. It's a real Jesus. place, right? Hell what? is a real place. A lot of people... Not only is it real, but people who reject Jesus, God, are going there. Mm -hmm. And that's not... It's not like optional. It's not like, mm, I wonder if I want to go there. No, no, they're going there. The people in hell want everybody that comes down there to be in the same state of that torment they that are. they are. Did you see any demons? Because, I mean, I've interviewed no. people. No, who, not who... that. Late, later in the hospital, I saw demons, but not in hell. Yeah. Okay, so you started talking 
to your wife and your family about what had happened because you wanted them to know about this incredible experience yeah, they, you had. And the thing that um, got so discouraging, everyone said to me, you need to see a psychiatrist, you're crazy, um, you know, get over it. Oh, it's just a drug trip. One of the things I, I hated was people would say, oh, it's just a drug trip. And I said, seriously? They didn't give me any drugs. I begged for drugs all day. Give me some drugs to help with the pain. They never gave me anything. How did it end with as far as going back to school and being a professor? How did your life change? And who, well, not who noticed the difference? Everybody noticed the difference. But the problem was is that all of my friends who had, who had been my good friends, and we all mock Christianity, the word got around very quickly that I'd become a Christian. And they were very unhappy, and I got shunned. And it was interesting, because I would see a friend of mine, you know, in the cafeteria, walking down the campus or something like that, and they'd see me, and they'd just go the opposite direction. They didn't want to have anything to do with me. The other thing that was disturbing was as a professor, a teacher, I began to realize that a lot of the students' problems were spiritual problems. Yes. Mm. Yet, because of the university, I wasn't supposed to talk to the students about that stuff. So I did a lot of closed door counseling with my students mm -hmm. to talk to them about spiritual things and about God and prayer and stuff like that. And um, I was threatened, threatened by my boss, the Dean of Liberal Arts, to not do that kind of stuff. Wow. But, and yet you could discourage Christian yeah. students from they were fine. Oh, that was God. fine. That's that was fine. fine. Yeah. But you not, couldn't... Not Muslim students, not, not Shinto students, not Buddha students, not Wicca students, witches. Yeah. Right. You, can, you don't, you know, no problem about, you know, talking, you know, you, you don't talk about them. It's Christians, Christianity you can't talk about. Yeah. That was taboo. Wow. So you said, um, I know Susie asked you this question about looking into the eyes of Jesus. You said you've painted him, um, but... They were blue, but they had every color. There was yes. a, there was another guest that I interviewed yes. that went to heaven that said the very same thing. Um, what is it you can tell us about the person of Jesus? The most important thing is, you know, God came into this world called the incarnation from birth, from conception, all the way up through death to experience what we experience, you know, the, the, the very God of God is so beyond this world that um, in, in seminary we called God such a mystery because he's so great, so beyond this world. But to come and live our life, to experience us, you know, to stub his toe, to be insulted, to, to laugh with us and to eat our food and sleep in the same house, I mean, it's like amazing. He totally gets you and me. He really, really gets us. And you know what? He likes what he sees. I'll tell you what Jesus doesn't like. When we harm ourselves, harm one another, and reject God, those make him very unhappy. And um, this may be a bit of exaggeration, but it's like, why would you stick a knife into the heart of God? Because when you blaspheme, yes. when you use the... GD and the, and the J term and, you know, stuff like that. You're literally sticking a knife into someone who loves you so much. Why would you do that? That's right. crazy. Right. Don't do that. And the Bible says, don't do it. Yeah. Well, you eventually were called into ministry and pastor a church. Yeah. How did your life change after that? I, I pastored for 30 years. I loved it because I loved the church because, you know, the church is made up of a bunch of fall down flawed <laughs> sinners. And one of the things that I love about the Christian church is like, as far as I know, I hopefully this is true, we all know we're sinners and we all need God and we all need help yes. and we all need forgiveness we and, we're all, and we're all striving to do, to, right. to, 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 to do the Christian thing, to follow Jesus and follow his way. Um, there's a few people in the church that are difficult to deal with. Um, but they're, they're the, the rare exception. There's a lot of saints in the church and there's a lot of super beautiful older people. I mean, there's, there's some people that I wanted to adopt. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i talking about this literally. There, I met older people that I want, will you please be my mama, you be my grandpa, you know? Um, so the church is a wonderful place. And 
I believe that the church is the only hope of the world. It's true. The church is a place where we can raise young people in faith, where we can take care of um, people that have difficulties, especially take care of the elderly and stuff yes. like that. Um, yeah. And it's a place where we can set values that this world wouldn't come up on their own. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think your story is, is fascinating, and he's written a book, My Descent into Death, and uh, what an incredible story. Uh, Rachel, when you hear these stories, it just makes heaven even more real and palpable, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you've been loving these stories lately. <laughs> yeah. Wonder why, I wonder know. why I'm loving these stories. <laughs> Anna, did you love hearing that? I loved hearing that, and, and I wanna know more about Jesus. Like, how tall was he? <laughs> Oh, probably six four, around six four. Yeah, six, okay. I've heard people say six two, six I've heard four. That. Yeah. Yes, different. Susie, any other last questions? No, I'm just happy, and I just want him to come soon. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, yes, I, I feel that way too, and I think your story helps so many of us just have a glimpse of what we have to look forward to. Mm -hmm. So I thank mm -hmm. you for right. that. Our life in this world is very, very short, mm -hmm. and we're going to spend forever and ever and ever yes. in heaven. So we don't have, to, our job right now is to make the best of what we got. Yes. yes, amen. Well, we are out of time and I want you to remember that God has a plan for your life. Amen. Heaven is real and he wants you to spend eternity with him. You know, when you surrender your life, God can use you to impact someone else's life. And so if you're watching today and you haven't accepted the Lord as your savior, or maybe God is challenging you today to surrender to his plan and direction for your life. I want you to call that toll-free number on the screen. We have prayer partners that are standing by that would love to pray with you. Some of you just say, well, I just want to make sure that I'm ready to meet the Lord. I want to be sure when I die that I'm going to go to heaven. Yeah. You're the one that needs to call right now. So call that number on your screen. Let us pray with you. You can also send us your prayer request by going to daystar.com and clicking on prayer. But I do want to thank Howard for sharing his powerful testimony with us. Be sure to pick up his book, My Descent into Death. We just barely scratched the surface. And for more on his ministry, you can visit him at howardstorm.com. Also, remember to join the conversation online by leaving us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. We always love hearing how Table Talk has touched your life. Thank you so much for watching. I pray this has encouraged you and that those of you that have lost loved ones, and you, you know they knew the Lord, and you know the Lord, guess what? Eternity is a long, long, long time. This life yeah. is but a vapor yeah. compared to the life to come. Make sure that you're ready to meet the Lord. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye for today.